All right, so how's everybody today? The weather is turning warm and nice, and nobody wants to be inside. It's going to be 80 degrees this weekend, isn't it? And that's uh, just the perfect time to go outside. It's nice out there today. And so I don't really want to be in here either, but I guess we're going to have to suffer through since uh, I like my cinchy job and I don't want to have to you know, find another one. So I guess I'll give you what you paid for, even though it's a beautiful day. It's a little windy out. A lot of windy. It's a lot windy out. That kicks up the allergy problem. So um, if I start sneezing, that's the reason. I've been sneezing all morning as a result of the wind and stuff blowing around outside. But I like the warm weather. I'm generally a summertime person. I'm not big on the winter, particularly here in Oklahoma, where we don't have a lot of activities that you can do anywhere. I guess if I lived, you know, where my dad lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and you can go skiing and enjoy the snow, I might like it more. But I have a tendency to like summer since you can go to the lake and you know, drop the boat and wakeboard and do all those kinds of activities that uh, we can do here in Oklahoma. So we were talking last time about the two forms of duty ethics, just as uh, utilitarian ethics takes on two forms. Duty ethics takes two forms. The oldest is religious absolutism. We talked about the problems that you're going to have with religious absolutism. Whose book are we going to use? The um, interpretation of that book can be problematic. So Kant says that well, we can't base it on religious, so we have um, one religious two rational We can't base it on a religion. So Kant says, well, what we have to do is we have to ascertain a priori what the duties are, and then, and I've given you this word before, a priori as opposed to a posteriori, we can develop universal principles based on the rational mind. Now, in order to do that, we have to do the exercise that Aristotle starts with in Nicomachean ethics and the Eudamian ethics that we talked about earlier in the semester, which is figuring out if we're going to say, what are these duties, where are they going to come from, and how will I know them? How will I know what these duties should be? So I think you have to start out, well, what, what is the purpose of a human being, going back to that idea of virtue, ethics, and Aristotle. What is the purpose of a human being? And I told you that Aristotle says that the purpose of a human being is the eudaimonic life. And by eudaimonic, that's normally translated as happiness, but that can't mean happiness in a sort of ordinary sense. It can't be happiness as in let's drink up and have another round. It's got to be the flourishing life. So is there some foundational bedrock that we can say that we can ascertain that you don't have to experience to know. You don't have to experience. Well, we can know things like geometry, geometric proofs. Wow. That's the the wind through the windows is spooky. I think we need a new building. Hopefully we'll we'll get we'll get a new building. That's what the dean is working on for us is getting a new building and maybe we'll get it about the time I'm going to retire, I, I imagine we'll have a nice, shiny new building and I won't get to take advantage of it. But. So, the flourishing life. Is there something we can know? Well, ge geometry, I suggested to you, are these proofs. Uh, a squared plus B squared plus equals C squared. Pythagoras didn't go around measuring right angle triangles, and it works really well. I mean, if you did, if you were experiencing this, it works really well if you have a 3, 4, 5 triangle. It becomes more difficult if you have other numbers. And so you can see this with the mind's eye. Well, are there things that we can see with the mind's eye that we can apply and ascertain to universal principles that 
form duties? Well, one of the ones that I think that we can know without experiencing it is that we all really treasure our life. We all value life. How many of you have read a rather thin book by Voltaire? Anybody know who Voltaire is? Who's Voltaire? He wrote Candide. Yeah, it's a, it's a really pithy little thin book. You can read it in one sitting. Voltaire considered himself a philosopher. He wasn't, really. He was what we would call a public intellectual. He wasn't an original thinker. He was really good as a stylist of other people's ideas and turning those ideas into thoughts of absolute clarity. One of his contemporaries said, his mind was a chaos of clear ideas. So he was really good at distilling other people's ideas. He considered himself a philosopher, but, but he wasn't. He was really what the French would call a philosophe, which meant a public intellectual. He gave himself his own name. Voltaire wasn't his name. Do you know what he was born? His birth name was Francois Marie Arouet, but he hated his family and he broke with them violently and gave himself the name Voltaire. He penned thousands of pithy little articles and things like that. He considered Candide to be a rather minor work, but it turns out that it may be his most lasting, one of his most lasting works. Students from time to time in this class particularly will ask me what they should have read to be truly educated. If you want to be a truly educated individual, what should I read? And I have a suggested reading list if you want that, I'll provide it to you. The first list, the first book on that list is the Bible. I think that if you want to truly be educated, you have to have read the Bible. It has had the most profound impact. It is the number one selling book of all time, and I think it's worth reading. But Candide is also on that list. What can marketers learn from Candide? It's not a novel, although it pretends to be one, but I think we could learn something about this concept of value co-creation from Candide. And the reason I say it's not a novel is because it's sort of like these little series of vignettes that don't necessarily make a lot of sense. If there's any theme to it, it's that there are three gardens. And in the beginning, Candide is born, it's, it's thought that he's probably the illegitimate offspring of the Baron. He's born in the Kingdom Westphalia, uh, in, the, in the Baron's castle to the Baron Thunder Tan Trunks. Voltaire hated the German language. He thought it was vul vulgar, and so he gave them all kinds of interesting names. And Candide is born in this wonderful place. We're told this is like a Garden of Eden in uh, Westphalia that he's born into. The castle is so wonderful that it actually has a door and a few windows, uh, Voltaire says. So it's a, a commentary on a philosophy that had developed at the time, which was uh, promoted by a guy named Leibniz. And Leibniz's philosophy was that this is the best of all possible worlds. And there's a character in Candide named Dr. Pangloss, and Pangloss literally means all tongue. And Dr. Pangloss is the tutor for Candide and the Baron's daughter, Cunegonde, uh, which is kind of a dirty sounding name in, in German, but Candide gets kicked out of that garden, literally with powerful kicks on his rear end by the Baron when he falls in love and, and experiences uh, carnal passion with the Baron's daughter, Cunegonde. And he spends the rest of the book trying to get back and get reunited with Cunegonde in the book. And at one point in time, they come across an old woman. They both, at, at various times, leave uh, Candide leaves Westphalia literally by being thrown out from falling in love with Cunegonde, and Cunegonde falls in love with Candide. And they go on a number of journeys. The second garden that they come to is El Dorado. Candide comes, in, uh, comes upon the city of El Dorado, and gold is so plentiful that the natives there just leave it lying around, and he picks it up and he puts it on a couple of burrows and takes it out. 
the value of gold is completely arbitrary, although what's maybe more interesting is that when we went off the gold standard, what is it that backs up the United States dollar? It's now what we call fiat money. What does that mean? What is it that backs up the, the dollar? When did we float the dollar, by the way? Anybody know when we floated the dollar when Richard Nixon totally took us off the gold standard and floated the dollar? What? Well, when did Richard Nixon, uh, when was Richard Nixon in office? He ran for office in 1960. He lost, right, in 1960 to John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas in 1960. Uh, three, uh, his vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, becomes president. He runs for a term in his own right in 1964. And Johnson then becomes uh, a very unpopular president as a result of the war in Vietnam. And so he decides not to seek an additional term for the presidency. And in 1968, Richard Nixon wins the presidency. He runs again for re-election and win. In 1972, we have presidential elections every four years. We have one this year that you all are going to participate in. How many of you watch the Republican debates or the Republican town hall? Donald Trump decided he's going to have his own little town hall off on his own. He's going to just totally take himself out and go and have a town hall with Joe Scarborough and. Mika, and he did that during the Republican candidates' main forum, which was hosted by Anderson Cooper on CNN last night. Who had the bigger ratings? Does anybody know? Who had the better ratings during that time period? I haven't seen the ratings yet. Probably Trump. I think it was probably Trump. I don't know. I haven't looked to see what the ratings are today. Who actually won the ratings? The last time he did this, when he had an event, who had the bigger ratings? Yeah, he, he got the bigger crowd. So Richard Nixon was reelected in 1972, and he floats the dollar in 1973. Shortly thereafter, the Watergate scandal breaks, and Richard Nixon is forced to resign, and his vice president, Gerald R. Ford, takes over and assumes the presidency. But Nixon floats the dollar in 1973 completely. At that point, you couldn't really go down and get the average consumer couldn't go down and get gold for their greenbacks, but we were, in theory, on the gold standard. We float it, and it becomes completely fiat money at that point. What does that mean that it's fiat money? What backs up the dollar then, if it's not the gold in Fort Knox? And I guess you could argue, you could make an argument that even if you have the gold standard, that's still sort of fiat money because. The price of gold is, after all, completely arbitrary. Why do we value it? Is it really useful for anything other than jewelry? Is it really useful for anything? As a metal, it's pretty soft. Can you build anything with it other than jewelry? If you get above 18 karat, what happens to it? Yeah, I mean, it, you can you can bend it very easily. So it's not a it's not a great building material. It's too scarce to be you know, much of a building material. Even if even if it weren't so soft, we, we don't have enough of it to build very much. So, is it really all that useful? I don't know. I understand that there are some antibiotics that are gold-based. Augmentin, I believe, is a gold-based antibiotic, so maybe it has some usefulness there as an element. But in El Dorado, he packs up some burrows because it's just so boring there after a while, and he goes off again in search of Cunegon. At one point in time, they're reunited, and there's this old woman that they run into. Turns out that the old woman is the daughter of a pope. Now what's wrong with that? What? Yeah, the Pope isn't supposed to have daughters, but you know, uh, 
Voltaire really didn't like organized religion, and so he makes fun. And it's one of the reasons that Candide was banned. He had to pin it under another name. But everybody knew when it was released that he was the author of it. They meet this old woman who is ugly and horrible and uh, bitchy. And it turns out that when she was a young woman, she was quite beautiful, and she was being sent off to marry a prince. And she got captured by some pirates, and they become stranded on an island, and in order to survive, they cut off one of her butt cheeks and eat it. And so she goes through and becomes a slave in many places and has all these travels and travails. And she says, and the reason I point this out, and it's worth reading, I'll read the passage to you, is that I think she strikes upon one of these things that we can get, this essence of what it is, and the ultimate value of being a human being. Because if we're going to ascertain what the duties are a priori, we're going to have to know what our purpose is. And she's talking, they're each giving their stories of tales of woe. And she says, well, I have, I've got the worst story. And she tells them the story about how she got captured by pirates who cut off one of her butt cheeks and eat it to, to survive. And all of these other things that happened to her. And at one point, she finally says, I've grown old in poverty and shame with only half a buttocks, but always remembering that I was the daughter of a pope. I wanted to kill myself a hundred times, but still I loved life. That ridiculous weakness is perhaps one of our most pernicious inclinations. What could be more stupid than to persist in carrying on a burden that we constantly want to cast off? To hold our existence in horror and yet cling to it nonetheless. To fondle the servant that devours us until it has eaten our heart. In countries where fate has led me and in inns where I've worked, I've seen a vast number of people who loathe their lives, but I've seen only 20 who voluntarily put an end to their misery. Three Africans, four Englishmen, three Genevans, and a German professor named Robeck. In fact, there was a German professor named Robeck who wrote an essay on suicide and then proceeded to kill himself. But I think that's it. You don't have to experience death. This captures it. In the most abhorrent of conditions, Life persists. You don't have to experience death to know that you don't want it. We, we cling to this life so dearly that I think we can make this a found rock, found foundational principle of what it is. And in fact, the subjectivists who argue that everything is subjective and it's all up to us, we can find this respect for life in all societies and all places at all times. Now, they don't necessarily respect other people's lives, but they respect the lives of themselves and members of the in-group. That's one of the prohibitions we can find. So I think that's something that we can know a priori, that we can build upon and think about. Now, is there more? Yeah, concepts is a lot more. So if we accept that one of the things that we work towards is life, a respect for life, and this desire to live. Well, then, what goes beyond that to make it less than an abhorrent existence, as she says in Candide? By the way, what we get in the third garden in Candide is not the Garden of Paradise, and it's not the Garden of Eden before the fall that Candide experienced. It's a garden where they go and they uh, Candide is finally reunited with his beloved Cunegonde, but she's become sort of horrible and bitchy and old, but she has one good skill. She's become quite a good pastry cook. Two things they won't allow into that garden. They won't allow her brother, who's become an intolerant Jesuit. There's no room for religion, and there's no room for sloth. They tend their garden, and they sell their, their wares and their vegetables in the local market for good profit. And I think that's one of the things that we can learn in an idea in marketing from value co-creation, that you should uh, make things that are useful and that, that are good, that are good, solid products. I think that's the ethical thing to do. Are there, is there more than that, though, that we can come up with? Well, Kant says, yes, there is. The end of the human life may be existence and flourishing, but in that flourishing, what else do we see? Well, what makes man then lots of animals. If we found, if we merely hang our hat on this idea of a respect for life, lots of animals 
have respect for their own existence, don't they? Most animals are fearful. They, 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 they survival instinct kicks in. Why does the deer run away when we, you know, enter the field? Well, they're uh, they're a prey animal, and they value their own life, and they 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 retreat. Lots of animals do that, don't they? They protect their territory. They they cling to life. Is there something more? What makes us different than other animal species? Although perhaps modern science is proving that we're not that different from other species. But what do we think makes us different? What makes us different? Lots of species cling to life. We don't have any natural predators. What? We don't have any natural predators. Oh, we do have natural predators. If we go back to that state of nature, weren't there predators <clears throat> that, that, that preyed upon man? Wild cats in Africa. There are two, if you go to the Field Museum in Chicago, you can see there was an, uh, a movie that came out by Val, with Val Kilmer as the star several years ago called The Ghost in the Darkness. Anybody of you see that movie? Oh, you should. It's a fascinating movie. It's a really, really, it's one of the few movies that Val Kilmer actually acts in most of the time. He's simply typecast and plays himself, but I think he actually acted in that. It's a true story. <laughs> there were these man-eating lions of Savo, and Savo in Swahili means a killing place. And these two lions, they were maneless males. One was white and one was dark. And they called them the ghost in the darkness. They attacked at night. And they deliberately killed for pleasure, it seemed. They, were, they actually liked it. The book, it's based on a book called The Man-Eating Lions of Sabo by the guy who built the bridge there at Sabo. And you can see them. If you want to see the lions, they're in the Field Museum in Chicago. How many of you have been to Chicago? How many of you have been to the Field Museum? You can go to the Field Museum, and downstairs in the basement of the Field Museum is where the man-eating lions of Sabo. They shot them and skinned them, and they put them on display there. It's a really interesting thing. You can see all kinds of interesting stuffed animals in the Field Museum in Chicago. But those are perhaps the, the most two. So we have. We have predators. I was I was talking more about like, yeah, like in Africa you can get but I'm not gonna walk out of the business building and get attacked by a lion. Like Well that's because we've done away, you know, I mean we've done away with them. We've 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 moved the mountain lions out. There there are people in California that get attacked. When I when I was getting my PhD in Las Cruces, the woman next door to me, I moved into this house, I sold my house in Oklahoma City, bought a house in Las Cruces. I moved into this house and I had little dogs. I had a big dog, a Rottweiler two shizus. And the woman next door to me says, now don't let your dogs out without you being out there because my dog got eaten by a mountain lion in Las Cruces. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, the lady's crazy. <laughs> like, she's, she's lost it. But one morning I was sitting out on my back deck and sure enough there was a, an arroyo that ran behind my house, which is a runoff ditch from the mountains from the Oregon Mountains, and uh, there went right by through the middle of Las Cruces, this cougar, right down the right down the ditch. So I guess she. I thought you know I thought somebody had probably the, a bobcat would eat uh, her little dog, but I didn't think it was a mountain lion. And sure enough, I was sitting there one day, and there went this mountain lion. So why don't we have predators? Well, because we built civilizations on the African Serengeti. We built villages and huts and things like that and, and fences to keep those animals out and our livestock in, but in the state of nature we have them. So what is it that makes us we can I mean we are generally a we're a predatory species and we don't have a lot of predators, but we have some. Are there any predators for the mountain lion other than human beings? What makes us different? Uh, I think it's the rational mind. Now, our, that we're capable of abstract thought, I think that's what makes us different from other animals, is this ability to engage in abstract thought. 
But do we really? Are we the only ones that engage in abstract thought? What about dolphins? There's lots of studies now that suggest that perhaps dolphins are as intelligent as we are and capable of abstracting in ways that we didn't think about. Dolphins are mammals, so they have to breathe air. They don't have gills. They give birth uh, live, and they have mammillary glands. That's what makes them mammals. They sleep in pods. They, they are a herd animal. And in order to rest, dolphins are not autonomous breathers like you are. When you go to bed at night, do you stop breathing or do you have to think about breathing? You don't stop breathing. You don't think about it. But dolphins actually, because they live in the ocean, have to think about breathing. And so there will be one dolphin that will stay awake, and it is that dolphin's job to make sure that each member, and he knows how long each member of the pod has been submerged, and he will push them to the surface so that they will breathe. And if he fails in that task and one of them dies, that dolphin is shot forever. He'll be cast out. Is that abstraction? Is that morality? There are more and more evidence to suggest that there are other creatures that maybe have this ability to engage in abstract thought. There are two parts of this that if you're offended by uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights, which you can find, it's a picture that you can find in, um, in any humanities textbook, but there's also a scene in this video where two bonobos are shown mating, so if that offends you, I'll let you leave. Uh, this is a TED Talk. I love TED Talks. What does TED stand for? Technology, Entertainment, Design. And it's really interesting, the, the business model that TED has done is really kind of an interesting business model. If you want to attend the TED conference, it's $8,000. Why would you pay $8,000 when you can get it online for free? But people do, and they're developing all kinds of new ways of delivering TED. We had TEDx here at UCO, by the way. We had some professors that participated in it. But they're still selling out their conferences. Why is this not coming out? Now this is very interesting because 
at the time, everything was about competition and aggression, and so it wouldn't make any sense. The only thing that matters is that you win or that you lose. But why would you reconcile after a fight? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is the way bonobos do it. Bonobos do everything with sex. And so they also reconcile with sex. But the principle is exactly the same. The principle is that you have a valuable relationship that is damaged by conflict, so you need to do something about it. And so my whole picture of the animal kingdom, and including humans also, started to change at that time. So we have this image in political science, economics, the humanities, philosophy for that matter, that man is a wolf to man. And so deep down, our nature is actually nasty. I think it's a very unfair image for the wolf. The wolf is, is after all, a very cooperative animal. And, and that's why many of you have a dog at home, which has all these characteristics also. And it's very unfair to humanity, because humanity is actually much more cooperative and empathic than, you, than they're given credit for. And so I started getting interested in those issues and studying that in other animals. So these are the pillars of morality. If you ask anyone what is morality based on, uh, these are the two factors that always come out. One is reciprocity, <coughs> and associated with it is a sense of justice and a sense of fairness. And the other one is empathy and compassion. And human morality is more than this. But if you would remove these two pillars, uh, there would be not much remaining, I think. And so they're absolutely essential. So let me give you a few examples here. This is a very old video from the Yerkes Primate Center where they train chimpanzees to cooperate. So this is already about 100 years ago that we were doing experiments on cooperation. And what you have here is two young chimpanzees who have a box. And the box is too heavy for one chimp to pull in. And of course, it's food on the box. Otherwise, they wouldn't be pulling so hard. And so they're bringing in the box. And you can see that they're synchronized. You can see that they work together. They pull at the same moment. That's already a big advance over, over many other animals who wouldn't be able to do that. And now you're going to get a more interesting picture, because now one of the two chimps has been fed. So one of the two is not really interested in the task anymore. <laughs> Now look at what happens at the very end of this. One is that the chip on the right has a full understanding he needs the partner, so full understanding of the need for cooperation. The second one is that the partner is willing to work even though he's not interested in the food. Why would that be? Well, that probably has to do with reciprocity. There's actually a lot of evidence in, in primates and other animals that they return favors. And so he, he will get a return favor at some point in the future. And so that's how this all operates. We do the same task with elephants. Now, with elephants, it's very dangerous to work with elephants. And another problem with elephants is that you cannot make an apparatus that is too heavy for a single elephant. Now, now you can probably make it, but it's going to be a, a pretty clumsy apparatus, I think. And so what we did in their case, and then we do these studies in Thailand with Josh Plotnik, is we have an apparatus around of which there's a rope, a single rope. And if you pull on this side of the rope, the rope disappears on the other side. So two elephants need to pick it up at exactly the same time and pull. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen, and the rope disappears. So the first tape you're going to see is two elephants who are released together, arrive at the apparatus, the apparatus is on the left, with food on it. And so they come together, they arrive together, they pick it up together, and they pull together. So this is actually fairly simple for them. There they are. And so th that's how they bring it in. But now we're going to make it more difficult, because the, the whole purpose of this experiment is to see how well they understand cooperation. Do they understand it as well as the chimps, for example? And so what we do in the next step is we release one elephant before the other, and that elephant needs to be smart enough to stay there and wait and not pull at the rope, because if he pulls at the rope, it disappears and the whole test is over. 
Now this elephant does something illegal that we did not teach it, uh, but it shows the understanding that he has because he puts his big foot on the rope, stands on the rope, and waits there for the other end, and the other end is going to do all the work for him. So, so it's, it's what we call freeloading. <laughs> But, but it shows uh, uh, the intelligence that the elephants had. They, they developed several of these alternative techniques that we did not approve of necessarily. So the other elephant is now coming. And it's going to pull it in. Look at the other, the other doesn't get to eat, of course. <laughs> this was the cooperation reciprocity part. Now something on empathy. Empathy is my main topic at the moment of research, and empathy has sort of two qualities. One is the understanding part of it. This is just a regular definition, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, and the emotional part. And so empathy has basically two channels. One is the body channel. If you talk with a sad person, you're going to adopt a sad expression and a sad posture, and before you know it, you feel sad. And that's sort of the, the body channel of, emo of emotional empathy, which many animals have. Your average dog has that also. That's actually why people keep mammals in the home and not turtles or snakes or something like that, who don't have that kind of empathy. And then there's a cognitive channel, which is more that you can take the perspective of somebody else. And, and that's more limited. There's few animals. I think elephants and apes can do that kind of thing, but there are very few animals who can do that. So synchronization, which is part of the whole empathy mechanism, is a very old one in the animal kingdom. And in humans, of course, we can study that with yawn contagion. Humans yawn when others yawn, and it's related to empathy. It, it, it activates the same areas in the brain. It also, we know that people who have a lot of yawn contagion are highly empathic. People who have problems with empathy, such as autistic children, they don't have yawn contagion. So it is connected. And we study that in our chimpanzees by presenting them as an animated head. So that's what you see on the upper left, an animated head that yawns. And there's a chimpanzee watching, an actual real oh, chimpanzee so watching a computer <laughs> screen on which we play these animations. And so yawn contagion that you're probably all <laughs> familiar with, and maybe you're going to start yawning soon now, uh, is, is something that we I share with other animals. And that's related to that whole body channel of synchronization that underlies empathy. And that is universal in the mammals. Now we also study more complex expressions. This is consolation. This is a male chimpanzee who has lost a fight and he's screaming and a juvenile comes over and puts an arm around him and calms him down. That's consolation. It's very similar to human consolation. And uh, consolation behavior, it, it, it's, empath it's empathy driven. Uh, that's actually the way they study empathy in human children is to instruct a family member to act distressed and then they see what young children do. And so uh, it is related to empathy and that's the kind of expressions we look at. We also recently published an experiment, you may have heard about it, on, on altruism in chimpanzees, uh, where the question is do chimpanzees care about the welfare of somebody else? And, and for, for decades it had been assumed that only humans can do that. that only humans worry about the welfare of somebody else. Now we did a very a simple experiment. We do that on chimpanzees that live in Lawrenceville, in the, in the field station of Europeans, and so that, that's how they live, and we call them into a room and do experiments with them. In this case, we put two chimpanzees side by side, and one has a bucket full of tokens, and the tokens have different meanings. One kind of token feeds only the partner who chooses, the other one feeds both of them. So this, this is a study we did with Vicky Horner, and here you have the two colored tokens, so they have a whole bucket full of them, uh, and they have to pick one, one of the two colors. You'll see how that goes. So if this chimp makes the selfish choice, which is the red token in this case, he needs to give it to us, we pick it up, we put it on the table where there's two food rewards, but in this case only the one on the right gets food and the one on the left walks away because she knows already that this is not a good test for her. And then the next one is the pro-social token. So the one who makes the choices, that's the interesting part here, for the one who makes the choices, it doesn't really matter. So she gives us now a pro-social token and most chimps get fed. So the one who makes the choices always get a reward. So it doesn't matter whatsoever, and she should actually be, be choosing blindly. But what we find is that they prefer the pro-social token. So 
that this is the 50% line, that's the random expectation. And especially if the partner draws attention to itself, they, they choose more. And if the partner puts pressure on them, so if the partner starts spitting water and intimidating them, then the choices go down and they actually don't want to... It's as if they're saying, if you're not behaving, I'm not going to be pro-social today. And this is what happens without a partner, when there's no partner sitting there. And so we found that the chimpanzees do care about the well-being of somebody else, especially these are other members of their own group. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, uh, with, with Sarah Brosnan, who started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my butcher monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and we will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. And I want you, and I'm going to give you some time at the beginning of the next 
class period to think about this as well, because I'm going to have you do a critical thinking exercise in your groups on this. Um, one of the things, he talked about uh, the, the elephant who he said was freeloading. What's the fancy economic term for that, that economists come up with for freeloaders? What is that called? What is the problem? Uh, free it's a free rider. That's the that's the fancy economic term. It's free rider, and the free rider problem in marketing and in economics is one that we have to overcome, particularly with regard to things like nonprofits. How does a nonprofit overcome the tendency for people not to join the nonprofit or give to it, based on uh, you know the fact that the nonprofit is going to continue to provide services? AARP is kind of a classic example. What does AARP do? Well, they they advocate on behalf of uh, the elderly, particularly with regard to Social Security and Medicare, and they try to keep the benefits up, and they're very effective at that. How do you get them to uh, to participate and donate to AARP? Well, you give them private goods that they can't get unless they're members of AARP to overcome the free rider problem. And what are those private goods that AARP gets you if you become a member that you don't get? Because they're going to lobby on your behalf to get Social Security, to give COLA's cost of living adjustments, and to increase the amount of benefits that Medicare will pay for those people. Well, it's things like discounts at hotels, restaurants, it's uh, discounts on airlines, it's the ability to buy insurance, and to buy uh, Medicare and Medicaid supplements at a reduced cost from everybody else through the AARP exchange. That's a private good, and that's how they overcome the free rider problem. So one of the things I want you to think about in this, and looking at this idea of the free rider problem, and the idea that there are animals that express, one of the things that we used to think we only were the ones that did this, that had this sort of abstraction, this idea of fairness. And fairness is a very abstract concept, isn't it? If you think about it, if I say what's fair, what, what do we say is fair? Let's suppose that we're going to distribute grades in this class. How should I do that? And you want me to distribute those grades fairly. This is a scarce resource, aren't they? Grades are a scarce resource. Because they, although they are intangible, they lead to tangible results and value for you. That's the reason you're here. I think I've told you before, Thomas Jefferson founds the first publicly funded secular institution of higher education in the world. It's called the University of Virginia. Historically, institutions of higher education were funded by who? Who, pro who promoted the first universities? What were the first three learned professions? Clergy, law, what's the third? Medicine. Didn't I tell you all this before? Yes. Clergy, law, and medicine are the three learned professions. And so that's what universities started out. The oldest of those three professions is which? Clergy. And so universities started out as ways to pass on theology. And so they were associated the Western, uh, in the Western intellectual tradition with the church. Universities were funded by the church. And the church and the state in most of Western Europe are not distinct and separate. In England, for example, the British crown is also, they, the queen is the head of state. She is the sovereign, the embodiment of the state. Sovereignty resides in the queen. But she's also the head of what? The Church of England. She is the defender of the faith in England. And so there wasn't the split in Europe. Now, in the United States, sovereignty resides with who? Who is sovereign in the United States? The people. The people are, we are the embodiment of the sovereign in the United States. We don't have a queen. And so our president acts as both head of state and head of government. Whereas in the United Kingdom, the head of state is the queen, the head of the Church of England is the queen, and the head of government is the prime minister, who receives his appointment from the queen. And he forms a government in Her Majesty's name. And so these institutions of higher education form to pass on theology 
And I say that grades are a scarce resource because one of the things that we're worried about as professors is something called grade inflation. Thomas Jefferson founds the first publicly funded secular institution of higher education in the world, one that is not devoted to it is, it is functioning by the state. You can say that Oxford is functioning by the state because it's part of the church, but it's completely secular. That's what makes the University of Virginia different from others. And his idea at the time of the founding of that institution was that it would not be a degree-granting institution, that what it would be would, would be a great place of learning where you could come, listen to the lectures, and leave when you felt educated. And I asked my students, how many of you would do that if I wasn't going to give you at the end of this class a grade that you could then use to compile a transcript that says that you are educated and qualified to receive that piece of paper that we will not hand to you at graduation day. We'll hand you an empty folder until uh, you pay all your dues and we make sure and then you'll get the nice fancy piece of paper that says you are educated and you have the Bachelor's of Business Administration. How many of you would do that? Would just come here and sit here and listen to me drone on and on? You're shaking your head now. Big F for you. Me, but... no, just in general, you don't want to do yeah. it, right? Yeah, okay. I probably would be one of those people that would come and do it because I really like thinking about these things. But most people want that piece of paper that says I'm educated. And by, by the way, by the time I got through the PhD program, that's all I wanted. I mean, I was so miserable. That's that they made it such a miserable experience that all I I just wanted three letters after my name. That, that's what I wanted because that was the ticket to be able to do this, to be able to come back here and teach. That was the the card. That was the union card that I needed. Was that document? And so I I wanted it at that point. But I I do like the idea of sitting around and thinking about these things. Now, because we're concerned about grade inflation, grades are scarce. We don't we don't hand out A's like they're candied mints in this class, or in any class. So how should I distribute them fairly? This idea of fairness really is very abstract. How should I distribute these precious resources that you all want fairly? <coughs> By the way, we do engage in discrimination all the time. You can discriminate for any reason except the wrong reason. And I will discriminate in this class based on the quality of the work that you turn in. That is discriminatory, isn't it? I'm going to make judgments about the quality of that work and assign grades based on that quality. So that is, in the strictest sense of the word, discrimination. So you can discriminate for all kinds of reasons, just not the wrong reason. What are the wrong reasons to discriminate against? And you would certainly say that those are unfair reasons to discriminate, right? What are the wrong reasons according to Title VII and Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Well, it's you don't discriminate on the basis of race, creed, color, religion, national origin, gender. right? Huh? Gender. gender. That's it. You don't discriminate on the basis of that. Do you, have, do you know how gender got included in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act? There was a representative who was a racist from the South, from Georgia. His name was Representative Smith. And he thought that if he included women in Title VII, he could pull enough votes away from Northern Democrats who wouldn't vote for the bill to defeat the Civil Rights Bill. And so he made an amendment on the House floor to include women in the protected classes of Title VII and the Civil Rights Act. And he became an unwitting hero to the feminist movement when it passed. Isn't that great? He got his just desserts. <clears throat> so how should I go about basing grades? Well, we're not going to base it on things like, you know, all all blondes are, are not are going to get a D. Because you know? I'm not I'm not blonde. So if you're blonde haired, I you know, sorry, sucks to be you. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna discriminate. Would that be fair? No? What? Do you think that's fair? I don't know if you'll ever have the class of lawn and say a lot of bees. Well, I don't know. Some of you are faux lawns. I don't see that many lawns. What color do you think your hair is? Huh? What color do you think your hair is? Okay, all right. What color do you think your hair is? Sort of blonde, kind of. Yeah, I was little. I had like bleach blonde hair, 
So then, that generally happens. It darkens with age until it starts going, you know, naturally blonde again. When, you know, the pigment gets reduced. So you know, I, we're not going to do it on that. Well, how should I base it? What's fair? Donald Trump talks a lot about fairness in his speeches. If the Republican Party doesn't treat me fairly, I'll consider running as an independent. What's fair? And they keep saying, well, what's fair? And he says, hey, you know what fair is. <laughs> no, that's begging the question. Fairness is fairness. That's circular reasoning. That's a tautology, right? It's, it's, it's begging the question. Don't do that. What is fair? So I guess we could say, you know, I, I could, we could have equality of results. How's that? Is that fair? I'll give everybody in here a big fat F. That's equal. I'm treating you all the same. How about that? Scarce resource. What? No? You don't like that idea? Why not? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I have not I haven't heard that one you know, from a college student. That's the first I've heard from a college student that their parents would actually, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child, I guess, is the philosophy in your household. It's not as bad now. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not as bad now. It's not as bad now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay. So you don't like, well, how about everybody gets A's? She'll like it. She'll like it. That's okay? She'll like it. I don't think anyone tries hard if you just give it an A. Yeah, if I just said everybody gets an A, what incentive would you have to even come? Yeah. Would you get anything? But that's equality of results, isn't it? How about we'll just we'll just split it down the middle? What's the middle path? C, I'll give everybody a C. C's get degrees. Don't they? You can D's may get degrees in limited amounts. You can have D's on your transcript, that's a passing grade. So you know D's may get degrees. I don't know. You don't like that idea? So what is fairness? There seems to be, I mean, the, the evidence seems to suggest that maybe we're not as unique as we think we are and that there are other animals to think about this abstractly. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do in your groups next time is, is given the fact that there is now evidence for this biological basis for ethics, does that lend some credence back to the idea of psychological egoism? That maybe it's innate, it's born into us. Think about that. I'll give you 10 minutes at the beginning of class next time to come up with a response to that. Is it something that is an A? What is fairness? Well, I think one answer and one of the things that Kant talks about is this idea what makes us different than animals, perhaps, is maybe not just the fact that we can rationalize and that we are capable of abstract thought, because it seems that maybe we are more and more capable of abstract thought or animals are more and more capable of abstract thought than we thought with modern researchers we're able to do things like hook them up to fMRI technology and look at what's functioning in their brain when they have to make these choices and again dolphins they've done lots of experiments with dolphins that seem to suggest that they do abstract I think one of the things that makes us different is autonomy and that's what Kant focuses on is that the idea of the rational being is autonomous now, how do we respect autonomy? Well, Kant gives us a formula in the categorical imperative. So again, we talked about this idea that there are hypothetical imperatives. Hypothetical imperatives exist because there is some want or desire if you want to get a better job or have a shot at a better job. You'll come down here, you'll go to the University of Central Oklahoma, you'll sit in that classroom, and you'll listen to me drone on about things like Nietzsche and Kant and Aristotle that you care nothing about because at the end of the experience, you will have achieved a piece of paper that says, I am educated and I have these skills, and I have endured, and that's worth something to employers, isn't it? Employers really, that's, that's valuable. 
College is not a test of intelligence. College is a test of endurance. And that's something that employers, particularly with your generation that is so prone to being distracted because we think that we can multitask, even though every single scientific study suggests that we really can't multitask. We think we can, and your generation is the worst at it. And at least this says to an employer, by God, they had the ability to sit there and listen. And, and there are loads of courses where you have had to sit there and listen to somebody who is less than entertaining. My student evaluations one year, one semester said, he's not very funny. I, I'm hysterical. <laughs> That's a lot. <lie. laughs> I am funny. We've settled that. You don't have to put that on my evaluations this semester. I am funny. But there are lots of people who you can, you know, I mean, how many of you have had a professor that is like, I'm going to age myself again, the Ben Stein in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. How many of you have seen Ben, ben Stein in Ferris Bueller's Day? Bueller, Ferris, Bueller, Ferris Bueller. How many of you have sat through something that resembled that? Well, you have. Dr. Dixon. Okay. <laughs> call my call my colleagues out. Right now. <laughs> yes. That's gonna end up on YouTube. Hopefully, you won't, hopefully you won't recognize the back of your head. There. Make sure I turn the camera off before you get up. And it didn't help that he was teaching MIS, which is super boring. Yeah. yeah. So, super boring. Huh? So. You know, this says you're, you're, you are worthy of, of some drive and determination and some stick to And hopefully, throughout that process, you get some substantive skills that you can use that will also be good for employers. I hope that the critical thinking that I have you do does that. It, it forces you to think outside the box. And those kinds of things, I think, will be critical in the workforce. A lot of what we do in the college classroom doesn't resemble things that you will be asked to do in the workforce. And so these exercises are designed to make you think quickly on your feet and in a group and come up with something. And you will be asked to do that when you get into the, into the world of work. When you go into a sales situation, you will have a client that will hit you with something that you just didn't think about. I can guarantee you. And you will have to think quickly on your feet and come up with an answer if you want to make the sale. And maybe you won't make the sale. I don't know. But this idea of autonomy then, I think is one of the things. And so Kant focuses on this idea of autonomy. We're going to allow individuals to make their own decisions. It's not that I'm going to give you all the grade, but I'm not going to judge you based on irrational criterion. I'm going to recognize that you are an autonomous individual and that you have the right to make choices. Some of those choices involve studying for classes and doing well on tests or not. And that's okay. It's your choice. Well, what does that mean if we say that you're an autonomous individual and that you have the right to make these choices? What kinds of things should we respect? Well, in the categorical imperative as opposed to the hypothetical imperative, Kant says with regard to rational beings, what we have to recognize is things that we should treat them as an end in and of themselves and never as a mean to an end. Now, this is the one that's difficult for business people because we are so driven by that utilitarian analysis. We are so driven. And as business people, aren't we going to use our customers? Now, one of the things that we talk about in thinking about this idea of value co-creation is that it's a partnership. But in the strictest sense of the word, you are going to use them, and they're going to use you. They're going to use you to provide them with services that are good, or products that they need, and you're using them to get what? Money that you want. Why do you want money? So that you can buy stuff. We build monuments to our stuff. They're called our homes. And when we fill that monument with stuff up, what do we do? Do we sell our stuff? 
Do we give our stuff away? No, 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 no. Get a bigger house so that you can do what? Buy more stuff. Somebody else's stuff is crap. Move your crap so I can put my stuff here. Right? So you, this is hard because we want that utility, and as business students, we, we focus on that. And Khan says, with regard to a rational being, you can't use another individual as a means to an end. You have to use them, or you have to treat them as an end in and of themselves. So what does this mean? What is it that we can, well, our actions have to be logically consistent. They must be logically consistent and universally applicable. What does that mean? Logically consistent, universally applicable. You can't ever have an exception. How do we treat another individual as an end in and of themselves, not as a means to an end, logically consistent, universally applicable? Never lie. Never lie? Never lie? Never lie. Khan says no. Never lie. Pretty one in. Richard Gere lies to the guy that he's trying to take over his company. He says, I've, I've got your contracts. You all remember this movie, right? Meets with the guy that he's trying to take over. Richard Gere is what we call, what is that called? Anybody remember from my other classes when I told you this? If you had my principal's class, we talked about this in there. What is Richard Gere in that movie? What does he engage in? It's called arbitrage. Arbitrage, right? Arbitrage allows you to invest, take a, an investment, and have Virtually, in, in pure arbitrage, you would have no risk. In at least one temporal slot, there would be a no-risk way of, of recouping and gaining money on your investment. So he buys businesses, he breaks them up because the parts are worth more than the whole, and sells them off. And the company he's taking over in Pretty Woman is a ship company, and he lies to the guy. He says, well, you know, you don't have, you don't have Navy contracts. Turns out that's a lie. They're just delayed some. At the end of the movie, the guy says, you were lying, you were bluffing? And Richard Gere says, yeah. And he says, well, you were good at it. He says, thanks, that's my job. So think about this, never lie. That's what Khan says. Khan would say, that. no, can't do that. What's it? And he says, it's my job. It's never lie in business? Never. Is it acceptable to lie in business? Can't ever sell a car. What? You couldn't ever sell a car. You couldn't ever sell a car? I don't know. I generally think that that's one of those things where DR logical ethics with regard to car sales and utilitarian analysis match. I think one of the reasons that people don't like car salesmen is because they oversell. And I don't think they know their product very well. If you go to car lots, for, for some reason, that these people never seem to stay with the same company for very long. I don't know what that is. And as a result, they don't really know their products. I, I, can, I can walk on a lot and I start talking to a salesman and I, and I can tell already. It's the rule of tall. I did this with my clients when I was a lawyer. You all know what the rule of tall is? They all lie. <laughs> when I was an attorney in, pra in private practice, if my client was talking, he was lying. I knew it. They are. I only had two old Milwaukee's. God, how many times did I hear that? Swerving all over the street, only had two old Milwaukee's. Sure, you did. They all lie. I think that. And one of the examples that I give in my sales class is about a Cadillac dealer named Sewell in Dallas. People actually go from Oklahoma to, to because they are so reputable. They don't lie and they don't oversell. And they, the experience is so good that they actually have a huge customer satisfaction and loyalty. So I think the car selling business is one where 
you really shouldn't lie, but if you are in an adversarial position in which you have a zero-sum game, should you lie? Not all business decisions involve zero-sum games, but some of them do. Should you lie? No, never lie. Kant says never lie. Never lie. How do I look? That's the reason I'm single. You look like hell, Robin. Pastels make you look like utter death. Go back upstairs and change. <laughs> I will not be seen with you in that outfit. <laughs> Have you seen the, I think it's called The Art of Lying or something like that? The Invention of the Lying. Invention of lying. Yep. Yeah. Very good movie. <laughs> Well, I'm out of time. Think about if there's a biological, and if that leads to this idea that maybe there is some credence in psychological egoism from the film, because there, is, there seems to be a biological basis. I'll give you 10 minutes at the beginning of next class. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll finish up, and then we'll move into chapter four. So be reading chapter four for next time. Uh,